Hey folks, this is Ray at DCRamRanker.com. It's today we have a complete user interface tour, menu deep dive, beginner tutorial, whatever you want to call it, on the Phoenix 7 series. Now this is not my full review video. That's up in the corner where I talk about accuracy and explicitly all those 17 new features. In this video though, I'm just going to walk through the interface slowly so you can go ahead and kind of see how it works and all the menus and the features step by step. Now I've got a huge list of things right here to go through, but I've also got it listed down below in the chapters there if you do want to kind of skip around to different sections. Essentially though, first we're going to start off with some of the basics around the widgets, and then some of the settings options, some of the new stuff like the touch screen, the health snapshot, etc. And then we'll get to the sports side of it, as well as the mapping side, and finish up with the music and contactless payments, and a few other kind of neat things along the way. So with that, let's get rolling. Now I've got the three units right here, the Phoenix 7S, the 7, and the 7X. Uh, they are basically different both in size as well as the battery lifetimes, but under the covers, the features are identical with the exception that the fact that the X here on the end has a flashlight, which is this feature right there. And I can double tap that to turn it on. Right now I've got it configured for red, but I'll show you all the options there in just a second. And then on the back here, they all have the same generation for Elevate optical heart rate sensor. And of course, you can see they are indeed different sizes. Uh, and so there is you know, certainly a size as well as weight factor to that. Now, I'm mostly going to go ahead and use the 7X here simply because it's the biggest and so it's the easiest for you to see on the screen as opposed to the other ones. All three of these units right here are the Sapphire editions, uh, and all three of them are also the Solar editions. There are essentially three tiers of Phoenix 7 units. There is the base units, which do not have sapphire glass or solar. There's the solar units, as well as the solar sapphire units. Uh, now the main difference between the solar and the solar sapphire units is the sapphire has sapphire glass, uh, which is a little more protective against breakage and scratching, uh, but also does reduce the brightness level a tiny bit, making the screen a little bit dimmer looking. But beyond that though, Garmin has tied two other features to that. In the case of the sapphire editions only, uh, you will get multi-band GPS, which we'll talk about later on, as well as 32 gigs of storage, as opposed to 16 gigs of storage. Now, all of these units have storage in them. They all have, again, 16 gigs of storage, uh, and all of them can download maps, and all of them can have music on there, and all of them have Wi-Fi. So that is a change from the Phoenix 6 in the past, uh, but that 32 gigs means that they preload maps on there, as opposed to you having to download the maps uh, using the new map manager. The maps are totally free. They're the same high quality, top active, or popularity routing, and all that kind of fun stuff built into them, uh, but you use the new Wi-Fi feature to download them. So if you buy the non-Sapphire, units, you'll just have to use the download manager. So with that, I'm going to get the other two units out of the way right there, and we'll start off with the main watch right here. So it's worthwhile noting that while I'm showing the 7X, there's no difference at all in any of the menu features that I'll talk about uh, between the Sapphire and non-Sapphire editions. Uh, that's all going to be the same here. If there is a difference where I talk about like the flashlight, I will certainly note that, but they're identical otherwise in every way, shape, or form. So with this here, this is the watch face. It is totally customizable, but one of the new features on the Series 7 is the ability to tap on any one of these things and get right to that widget. So I'm going to see the steps on the left-hand side there. I'm just going to long hold that for a second, and boom, it takes me straight to the steps. Uh, and then I can also do another new thing, which is to swipe left and right. Now, in this case, I can't swipe beyond midnight for this particular graph, but if I go to something like heart rate, so there's my heart rate down here on the right-hand corner, I'll tap that instead. And now this one, I can slide along that using my finger. So this is obviously showing the touch screen right now. Uh, in general, the touch is pretty good for the most part. I haven't had too many issues with like wet fingers or things like that and sweat. You still have all the buttons though. So you have five buttons, three on the left-hand side and then two on the right-hand side. In general, this upper right-hand button right there is for confirming things or selecting things. And in general, the bottom right-hand button is the back uh, escape button. Whereas these three buttons over here navigate through the menus. Uh, so you can see I can swipe down to the widgets if I want to like this, um, or I can just simply use the buttons uh, to go down. Now when I'm holding the watch uh, up here, up here, that's simply so that you can see what's going on. The watch doesn't fly away when I press a button. So there's no buttons up here. This is just me simply stabilizing so I can press down like this uh, or up, whatever the case may be. Um, so. The first back on that watch face there, this is totally customizable however you want. You can change any of these data fields here. You can put custom watch faces on it. You can download watch faces. Uh, the world's your oyster there. I can put like someone's face on it if I want to, uh, anything you want. You then get down to widgets. These are also customizable. Uh, these are largely, in fact, entirely stock widgets, uh, but you can also download third-party widgets onto them. Uh, so you can see I can tap into sunset right there. I can see more information about that. Uh, if I go back, I can do this for pretty much every widget. So the weather widget, for example, has other pages. You can see these little dots right there. That means other pages within that. So if I scroll down, I see the weather options. 
If I go down further, some of the training ones, for example, here's my training status right there. So pulling this up, you can see uh, I'm productive in training status, uh, my current VO2 max. Uh, and then this is again, based on my most recent cycling activity, but it'll be based on most recent activity, either running or cycling. Uh, so depending on what you've done latest. Uh, and if I go down again, you can see my training load. Uh, so today is Monday, it's only not even lunchtime yet. So I haven't done any workouts yet today. Took Saturday off after a pretty big week and then did some workouts yesterday. Going down again, you have the uh, load focus over the last four weeks. So basically showing you which particular load buckets that you're in. Uh, and then finally, the number of recovery hours expected. So I've had a pretty big week last week, uh, about 19 hours of running and cycling and hiking. So uh, that's starting to catch up a little bit there. Uh, and then you go down. These are all widgets that you can customize again, just like uh, you've been in the past on past Garmin watches. So you can see here steps, and then you can see distance, average, et cetera. And all these, if you go down the very, very bottom, way down here, there we go, I've got the ability to edit it, uh, and you can edit which ones are here already, as well as then add additional ones at the bottom there. Uh, and then again, you can add third-party ones as well using the Garmin Connect IQ app. Uh, now, one last thing to talk about here is the sleep uh, capability. So if I go back up here, here is my sleep chart right there. Uh, so crack that open and you can see last night I had five hours, 36 minutes of a sleep time, uh, sleep score 74, quality fair, uh, and restorative sleep. And if I tap this upper right hand button, I can get a little bit of message about uh, what my sleep was like. Uh, my exercise last night or yesterday, sorry, led to good sleep uh, last night, keep exercising. Now, I find these are actually really spot on. My one yesterday was insanely good. And basically said that I had like good long sleep, but not great restorative sleep because I was interrupted a bunch of times, which was true. Um, so Gar Garmin seems to continue to up their game on this. Uh, if I go down, then I can see the time periods that it believes I was awake and REM sleep and light sleep and deep sleep. And I don't put a ton of faith in these estimates because even like gold standard uh, sort of scientific stuff is only like 85 to 90% accurate. So uh, this stuff here isn't like super accurate either, but that's all right for the purposes of what we want. Um, I'm not really looking at that, mostly look at how much sleep I got in total. Uh, and then you can see there's that same kind of recommendation. Overall length of sleep was a bit shorter, uh, but my body recharged relatively well. Uh, and then up here is body battery, uh, which is essentially like how much energy do you have over the course of the day? It recharges each night, in this case, 89% last night. And then I'm down 22 uh, points already, 20% already over the course of the day. Now, just a quick note, if you're finding this video interesting, useful, informative, something at all, just go ahead and whack that like button right now. It really does help out this video and the channel quite a bit. So going on back here to the main screen, uh, on the back here, flipping it over, this is the new Gen 4 optical heart rate sensor. It's the same optical heart rate sensor as in the Venue series, uh, both Venue 2 Plus and the Venue 2, as well as the 945 LTE last summer. Uh, the main difference though on the Phoenix is that they've actually made a glass covering now as opposed to being just plastic in the past. And uh, Garmin says this should reduce sort of potential for crackage um, in certain conditions, but uh, overall just makes it a little better. You can see that green light then powers on, goes to a higher power when I took a finger off because it's trying to find and lock that heart rate. Uh, and then if I were to go into the pulse ox, uh, I would get the red light. Uh, so if I can see if I can trick it to do that here, I'll go down to pulse oximetry. Uh, that's for blood oxygen levels, which down a little bit further. There we go. And then I can see this 96% from about 30 minutes ago. And I'm gonna go ahead and I gotta trick this there. So I'm gonna say, try again. Yep, so I'm gonna flip this over and then put my finger on it. Tap try again and give it a couple seconds to go ahead and turn on. You'll see the red light, just give it there in the background there. And boom, you can see that red light. Uh, and then it flips back to yellow and turns off. So Garmin's done a pretty good job at doing uh, error detection of false positives on this, where it'll go ahead and turn it off the second it rec recognizes that you've even done movement or something else. Because if you look at an actual um, testing sensor, I've got one over there. It's generally spot on with that, as long as you're doing the same thing they would expect in that uh, sensor, like the medical grade sensor, where you're not moving around, you're just sitting still, which is how those sensors are certified by the FDA uh, and in Europe as well, is that you're sitting still, you're not moving, and then you take that reading. If you do the exact same thing, you will generally get the exact same results uh, between those two within 1%, which is uh, actually even higher than like the FDA certification, which I believe is then plus or minus 5%, which is a, a lot by the way. But um, nonetheless, uh, you can go take those measurements. I generally don't use the pulse ox stuff. I don't find a ton of value in it day to day. Um, there's three core cases. One is to do it at sleep only. Uh, one is to do it as a one-off setting like we did right here. And then one is to do it 24 by seven. Um, and so the one-off is generally used in high altitude uh, climb 
timing and things like that, where you may take that reading there. Sleep can sometimes be used around sleep disorders or even around other health uh, aspects, but I don't find a lot of value in either of those. And mostly it's just a huge, huge, huge battery burn. So I would not recommend turning it on unless you have a very specific use case that you're trying to aim for. What I think is probably a better thing to do is to use the health snapshot feature instead. Um, so if I tap up here to there and go into the sport menu, which I know is kind of a strange place for it, but that's where it is. Uh, you can go down and you can go down to sports and you'll see health snapshot. If it's not there, just go down below into the next set of sports sections and then eventually down into the plus for add and you can see all these sport profiles right there. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. So go back here to the health snapshot. Uh, and this is introduced on the Venue 2 series last spring. And uh, what it basically does, is it takes five measurements. Uh, so once I press to start to measure there, uh, it'll go ahead and take these five measurements, one being stress, two being your HRV value, three being your pulse ox, four being your resting heart rate, and five being your breathing rate. Uh, it takes that over the course of two minutes and gives you the average for them. I would recommend that you sit down for a minute first before pressing start, because if you like run to the couch and then sit down and do it, if those things are all gonna be dropped up. Uh, the point of doing a health snapshot though is consistency. So all those same metrics are actually tracked behind the scenes uh, by Garmin. And with exception of HRV, you can see all those same metrics day to day and plotted over days and weeks and months and even years, I guess. Uh, but with a health snapshot, you're doing that at the exact same time every day, whatever time it is that you define. You don't actually do it the same time every day, but you're in control of that. So most people might do it say five or 10 minutes after they wake up. Uh, as opposed to the other data points, it's just whenever Garmin takes those readings, which is essentially 20 24 by seven. Now at the end of that particular uh, session, it'll go ahead and show you those metrics. It's also saved in the Garmin Connect app. And in turn, you can even export it out as a PDF file if you wanted to, to give to a doctor. The one downside is you can't trend just the health snapshots over time. So it's kind of a bit of a bummer. I wish you could really do that and say, hey, trend just my health snapshots because I know those are consistent and I know I'm controlling all the variables on those. One more thing to note here, uh, back in the main settings area, is the new sleep manager. Now it's not actually managing like your sleep, it's managing what the device is doing while you're sleeping. Uh, so this is buried way down there in there, but it will mention this the very first night that you go to bed, uh, it'll show up on the watch. So you can see it then, uh, it's a little more obvious there, but uh, if you go into the settings, so hold this middle button right there to get into the settings and go down into the very bottom here, system, and then down to sleep mode. There we are right there. Uh, this basically defines what happens on the device when uh, you go to sleep. Uh, and you can see how it defines that schedule. Every single day can be different. Uh, and so you can customize that. You can say, hey, I'm gonna assume that on Friday, Saturday night, it's party night. And we're gonna change this right there to be way later in the night. So you can just change that. I'm just holding this button down to change the plus. Uh, we'll just call it, you know, 1225, sure. And then I tap this again to change the other side. Certainly not waking up at six. Uh, so we're gonna change that to be, you know, quite a bit later than that. I'll call a couple more seconds here. There we go, sure, that'll work. Um, and then apply this to more days. Yeah, I can apply it to whatever days I want to. Uh, we're gonna apply it to, uh, let's see, Sunday as well, there we go, and that'll work, okay. So those are for the weekend essentially. Uh, and then you can see the new sleep schedule there. And if we go back now, so what's gonna happen here, oops, sorry, back, there we go. Uh, what happens at sleep time? Uh, the watch face, do you want to don't change or put in a sleep watch face? The sleep watch face is a kind of a really simplified watch face with just the time on it. Uh, and it shows the fact that all your notifications are disabled. Uh, you can go back there. What happens with the backlight? Um, so you want to change the brightness of the backlight during sleep to be less bright, for example. Uh, what's the timeout? Uh, only eight seconds. Uh, now in the case of the Phoenix 7X, you've got the flashlight that you can use at night, which we'll talk about in just a second here. Uh, but for other watches, sometimes I actually use the display to get around at night. Uh, so in that case, you may actually want your timeout of the display longer at night because of the fact that you want to use this for more than just eight seconds and I have to keep on tapping it. Uh, so click on back there. Do you want touch enabled or disabled at night? Uh, and then do you want the do not disturb on and battery saver on? These are all new things in the Phoenix 7 series to be able to go ahead and customize how the watch uh, works during sleep time or when you're sleeping. So. With that, let's talk about the flashlight. Uh, so as you see at the top here, this little bar, and this is just on the Phoenix 7X only. Uh, so Garmin has always used the X series of watches since the beginning of time uh, as a way to test or experiment or showcase new features. So that was many years ago, for example, the Pulse Ox feature, or it was mapping uh, and so on. Those are all features that are just available and Solar was another one uh, on the X series. And eventually the next iteration, it becomes available on all units. Uh, so for now, this is just in the Phoenix X, uh, Phoenix 7, X, it is not on Epix either. And you can see on top there, 
there's actually three lights. There's a white one right there, a white one right there, and the middle is a red one. Uh, and now there's two ways to go ahead and turn this on. Well, actually a lot of ways, but there's two core ways. The first is to double tap this upper left hand button, and you'll see it turns on, in this case, the red light. Uh, but I can go into the menu instead, so the controls menu, by holding this left hand button right there, and then I'll go to the flashlight, so it's right there. So I'm gonna swirl around the controls menu, flashlight option, and this is the flashlight. So the bottom right now is red is on. I can tap this upper right hand button there to turn it off. Um, or I can go up and say, this is one uh, notch of white. There we go. Uh, and I can go brighter, two notches, three notches, four notches. Uh, now it uses both of uh, those white LEDs in all the settings, uh, it just at four different brightness levels. Uh, and it's pretty darn bright. It's in the same ballpark as my uh, iPhone 13 Pro is in terms of brightness on the white lights. I can use them relatively similarly, a little bit different like hue slightly, but uh, very, very similar. Uh, and you can again, control this wherever you want. And they'll stay in that last setting. So let's just say right there is that, I turn this off, I go back over here, just back in the menus at any point in time, anywhere in the watch, you can always just double tap and boom, the light comes on to whatever the last setting setting was. Uh, and again, this is one of those things that people's like, oh, that's kind of inspector gadget silliness, but it's super practical. Uh, and I actually like the red light at night, to be honest, uh, because it's not so like glaringly bright. Even in the lowest setting, it's pretty bright. I wish there was an option to like go to one LED maybe on the white light, uh, for example, but the red light's great to get around. You can see what you're doing. Here's just some B-roll footage of me walking around the stairs in my house uh, last night with this. Uh, but also even outside, uh, it's super useful on the white side of things, uh, being much brighter for trails and stuff like that. And that's where you get to the sport side of it. So if we go into the run options here, so just going up to the sport modes, we're gonna choose run, no, I think I just hit bike. Uh, we're gonna choose, go back, choose run. Uh, and then I'm gonna go into the options by holding this right here. So going down into run settings, and then go to flashlight, way down here, there's so many settings. Uh, so there we go, flashlight. There's a couple core ways you can use a flashlight in sport mode. In the case of running, there's actually a cadence mode. And the way this works is that um, it looks at your arm going back and forth, and it tries to time it so that when it's forward, it's the white light, and when it's backwards, it's the red light. In practice, it's not really perfect. Uh, you can see some footage of that right now, uh, but in like, reality, it doesn't really matter because you're just trying to like show visibility. So this is mainly in this case for people to see you as opposed to like you having great, um, you know, visibility on the trail of head. We'll get to that in just a second if you want that. But in terms of seeing you, so like there's a running path out here that's got some little lights and stuff on it uh, that I use often, but it's not like super well lit that someone might not see me depending on what I'm wearing at night. Uh, it's a bike path primarily. So this is something that makes it really easy to see me, uh, but I can still see using just the ambient light around. Uh, so that's the cadence option. Uh, uh, and so you can see mode is cadence and does that. One important thing that I learned though, is that you wanna make sure that you have the wrist on the same wrist that you defined in the watch. If it's not, it won't work that well. Uh, so make sure that whatever wrist that you set the setting on in the settings of the watch is the actual wrist that you're wearing for this. Otherwise it gets all dorked up cadence wise. Uh, so there's other options though. And you can see these right here. There's a uh, blink, pulse, beacon, a blitz, and then back to cadence again. Uh, and so each of these then has additional options like the speed as well as the color uh, that it does that. So uh, if I go back here, let's just say medium, we're gonna go to fast, there we go, and the color is white, sure. Uh, and status can be always on or after sunset only, or off. Uh, so I'm gonna turn always on, and this will not start that flash strobe light until I actually hit the start button up here. So I do that right now. And now you can see it's blinking. Uh, and I can change all those settings and you can do it in real time if you go back into the menus, but I won't bore you with that. I'm gonna create an entire flashlight video, probably just dig around somewhere in the corner eventually over the next day or two uh, and show you this in more depth. It's really cool stuff. I really wish I had been on Epix, uh, but unfortunately it's just on the 7X. Uh, but I think it's neat. I'm hoping that it gets onto other watches over time. Uh, beyond running, I've also used a cycling uh, once or twice when I got basically late on something I wasn't expecting to be out that dark. Uh, in this case, I just put up my handlebars and turned it on and I was good to go. And it worked out pretty well just for other folks to see me. I could see just fine, uh, but it's handy for other folks to be able to see me. So that is a flashlight there. Once I stop this here, let's discard this, that'll turn off. There we go. And watch this, there we go, boom, it's off. And again, I can always, right now I can go boom and tap that and have it be always on uh, and then tap it off just like that. 
Okay, so let's talk about solar at this point. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, there's three different uh, levels of the Phoenix 7 series. There's the base without solar, there's the solar, and then there's the solar with sapphire glass. Uh, now, the solar panel is in two different parts there, and you can see it around the outside edge, uh, right there, that little red ring that you see reflecting around the, right there on the inside, all the way around. Uh, that is one solar strip, and that's effectively 100% of the solar's rays, if you will. So in that case, it's not technically 100%. There's like a bunch of fun math behind that, but for the purpose of this conversation, we're keeping it simple and call it that 100% of everything that hits this display gets converted into energy. And there is a secondary solar panel below the entire uh, glass itself, uh, and that one is at 7%, which is slightly down from the 10% of the previous Phoenix 7 or Phoenix 6 series. Uh, but that's because Garmin says that sapphire glass is a bit more dim, which is certainly true, and thus they didn't want to have that solar layer there and make it even more dim. Uh, so you can't see that at all, it's just below there. Uh, below the glass above the display and sits there and harvests the energy. Now, in the case of the Phoenix 7 series, if you compare the Phoenix 7X to the Phoenix 6X, Garmin says that it has 54% more uh, solar uh, square meterage, if you will, or square footage, square size, size on the panel because of the fact that this ring is wider. And here is a Phoenix 6. It's not the 6X, but you can kind of see the point there. Uh, if you look at this little ring there, it is super thin around that outside edge, right? And then here is the Phoenix 7 uh, solar, and you can see that ring is dramatically wider on that. Uh, so quite a bit wider, and that in turn results in more solar power. Now that in turn then results in more solar life. Uh, so Garmin says up to 68% in some of the core modes. I'll put the whole battery thing on the screen right now, uh, but it's a lot in some modes. It's a whole bunch to the point where you're not likely going to get forever battery life, but you're going to get pretty darn close depending on where you are in the world and what time of year it is. So when you go into the solar menu right there, so solar intensity, uh, it's always doing solar in the background. And today I was outside for a little bit, uh, but it's the Netherlands. It's, you know, basically overcast, not too sunny out right now. So I can't really get a ton of solar power here. Uh, if I go outside, though, I'm still going to get some. And if I put this outside of my jacket because it gets cold right now, I'll probably get between 30 and 40,000 uh, lux. And you see lux hours at the top right there. Uh, and if I go down to to this unit right here, which I mostly used last week, uh, you can see if I go down to solar, so go up here, solar intensity, I'm gonna go down. You can see last week on Wednesday when I was hiking in the Canary Islands, or sorry, that riding on Wednesday, um, I was at just 150,000 uh, lux hours in fully sunny conditions on the top of a volcano, but in winter though. Uh, and that's generally what I've seen is that if I look at the solar conditions in the summer, for example, or in sunny places uh, in the summer, you're looking at roughly between 100 and 150,000 uh, versus in the winter on a sunny day uh, here. In fact, the sun just popped out right now. I'm probably going to float between uh, 20,000 and 50,000 or so. Uh, uh, even in the winter. And all of Garmin's specs are based on three hours of 50,000 uh, lux conditions. So if you look at that and say, hey, if I'm outside all day in the summer, then it's way, way higher. And Garmin has confirmed that it will take the extra power beyond the 50,000. Uh, but your little sundial uh, that you can see back right there at the very, very top, uh, that has 10 little pieces around the outside edge and the sun in the middle, that only fill up to 50,000. So once you get beyond 50,000, you don't get visual extra credit, but you do get actual battery power behind the scenes. Uh, so anyways, that's solar. Uh, the general gist of it here is that you're basically going to go ahead and get extra power. Uh, it's not going to power the entire watch, you know, forever, uh, unless you live in a sunny place and spend all of your time outdoors. So if you lived in the Mediterranean and, you know, wore short sleeve stuff and spent most of your days outdoors, you're probably going to get forever power. Um, but if you live here in Amsterdam, you're not going to get forever power in the winter uh, unless you are doing short sleeves every single day and spending your entire day outside, then you might get relatively close, maybe if you have enough sunny days in a row. So that is solar. Let's talk about sports stuff. Uh, so on the upper right hand corner right there, I'll tap to go into the sport menu, and you can see all these sport options right here. Now these are some of them. I can go down below and I can go to add, and I can add far more sport options right here. Uh, there's tons of them, including a couple new ones like windsurfing and kite surfing here. Uh, and you can see all these are right there all the way down. And we've reached the bottom, okay? And if all else fails, you just put other. So like you can say it's cow tipping or whatever the case may be. I'm just going to go back though here up to the top and show you the running one real quick. There we go, run. So once I'm in run, it's going to give today's suggested uh, workouts. In this case, it's recovery workout. As I said before, 
pretty big week last week, uh, 30 minutes at 955 mile pace. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say, nah, not right now. Uh, and then you'll see right there, it says touch disabled. And that's because by default in sport profiles, unless you change it otherwise, touch is actually disabled. Uh, and that works out in most cases, because I think for me personally, I prefer to use buttons. But in some sport profiles like hiking, I might want to use the map. And in that case, it's all or nothing, unfortunately. So you still want to go ahead and enable, uh, for example, touch on the map. In order to do that, you will need to go ahead and enable touch for that particular sport profile. Now, and that's easy enough. You just press uh, up to get into the menu there, run settings, go on down until you find a touch option, and then just simply enable. So in this case, it says touch for system, which means I'm going to take my overall system settings for touch. Uh, and I'm just going to turn it to on and said, for this particular profile. Now, since we're here, we'll talk about the new multiband GPS. This is only available on the Sapphire editions. Um, this is true of both the Phoenix 7 series as well as the Epic series. And multiband GPS is sort of touted as a holy grail of GPS accuracy. And that's because it's using multiple frequencies to go ahead and allow you to connect to multiple constellations of satellites. And in turn, essentially like more than doubles the potential satellites that you connect to at the same time, uh, to the point where you can hopefully get super accurate GPS. Now I talk about that in way more detail in my full end up review up there and the written one down below and all that stuff. In short, yeah, it's good in some cases, but it's not like the holy grail yet. I think that'll take a little bit of time. So if I go on down though, into the settings for this particular sport profile, and I can also do this in the entire watch as well, you'll see satellites all plus multi-band. Uh, so there are a couple different levels here. The bottom one is no satellites. That's obviously not gonna work very well if you're outdoors. Uh, then you've got the defaults, which is using my system default because there's two levels of satellite options on the Phoenix 7 series. You can do the defaults across the board for all sport profiles, which I've set to be all plus multi-band, um, or you can do it at a per sport profile level. So depending on where you're going and what you're doing, keeping in mind that the more uh, things that you enable here, in other words, multi-band is way more battery hungry than uh, the base GPS. In fact, this GPS only one is relatively new in the case of the Phoenix 7 and the Epic series. And it's not new in that there was always a GPS only option previously, but this option has been dramatically revamped according to Garmin, uh, and that it has way better GPS GPS battery lifetime than it used to relative to the battery consumption. Uh, so this is something that's basically if you want okay GPS or you don't have very complicated environments, like just say you're hiking out in the desert with nothing around you, just like flat desert land or flat farmland, probably just get away with this just fine and it's not going to be a big deal, especially if you're going for a long distance. Then you have all systems. This is going to go ahead and enable all the systems and dynamically switch between them. So it's going to enable uh, Galileo and GLONASS and all the different options of satellite constellations uh, and then switch between them automatically. And then finally, the holy grail is the all of those things plus multiband, so the dual frequencies there. At the very bottom, you have ultra track. This is not like ultra like ultra the best thing ever. Uh, this actually reduces the accuracy, uh, but has way better battery life. So it's gonna take uh, essentially just a small snapshot of GPS every couple minutes and try to string all the points together. So don't use this if you're going fast or if you've got a lot of switchbacks or stuff. But again, like that scenario, if, if you're like hiking alongside of a road in the desert that goes straight forever, that's a perfect option because you're not, the accuracy isn't super important. Uh, but I would never use Ultra Track unless you absolutely positively have to. Uh, and even then I would question your life choices. I would, I would find some other way to charge your watch up or something like that uh, to get those battery lives. And here's all the battery lives in a chart right now uh, for the different levels and what those particular mean. Okay, going on back here into this, uh, we're just gonna go back to the main page and I'm gonna go ahead and actually just start this workout real quick. Uh, you'll see the flashlight just turned on. I'm gonna turn that off. Um, there we go, I'm just gonna turn to steady for the moment then. I'm gonna go down and I wanna show you the stamina page. Uh, so these are of course all of your running pages first off. So you can see, uh, for example, my heart rate, distance, time, pace. You can customize all these by pressing this middle button right there. Go into that, uh, run settings, data screens, and you can add your own data screens to this by going down to the bottom, and then press add new. Custom, heart rate, run dynamics, running dynamics, run a partner, compass, elevation, music, clock, uh, and custom is where you then would say, I'm gonna choose a different layout. I'm just scrolling through all these layout options right there. You can see there's tons of them, uh, up to eight data pages at a time on this. And then you can go and customize every single one of those fields with tons and tons of data options. I mean, there's literally hundreds of different data fields there. Uh, but I'm just gonna go with what I have right now on this and go down in particular to the new stamina field. So the stamina field is essentially looking at your energy during the workout. So think of it kind of like body battery, but how long and how far can you go? Uh, so 
if I go right here, uh, you'll see I've got 88% stamina, meaning it's looking at my day and saying, hey, based on my day right now, that's the most you're going to get. Uh, and then the potential as well. So these right now match. And the potential is a long-term one, and the top one is a short-term one. To me, they should be switched, but that's fine. And then there's your pace and your current heart rate. Uh, now, as you go along, the idea here is that this is used primarily in like longer-term stuff. So perhaps a you know six-hour endurance race, whatever the case may be. But you can also use in intervals. It just doesn't, it's not quite as responsive as you might think. It kind of works, but it's not as good as the longer term stuff. Uh, so in the case here, if I bring up another watch that I've already configured slightly differently on, uh, this one I have over here, I'm gonna go down to run. I've got this same one right there, but I've also added a new one. Uh, this is my current stamina, yep, potential, just like over here, right, same, same, but I've added stamina distance and stamina time. So that's gonna show me how much distance at this current heart rate intensity, and then how much time at this current heart rate intensity. And here's a little photo from yesterday on a particular run, and I got the next page here, which is showing that in a chart format. Uh, so again, how much distance and time, and then you see that little line there, uh, that line's gonna create a separation between those colors uh, when you get the fact that the potential is different than your overall stamina. Uh, so in other words, your potential is going to slowly decrease over time. That's the overall long-term potential for your day. And then the stamina, that's the short-term one, uh, will kind of go up and down. So as you stop after an interval, it'll recover slowly. And then as you start running hard again, it'll dip down again. You'll keep on going the entire way down to the end of the run. And you can see here's a screenshot what that looks like uh, from an interval workout yesterday, where you can see that kind of wobbling between those two lines compared to a seven hour ride from last week that you can see on the screen now, where it just kind of slowly goes down over the course of the entire day. There's a couple of moments there where I, you know, sprinted hard or climbed or whatever pretty hard for a little while, and then I kind of recovered. But by and large, uh, it slowly ended up. And I end up that entire workout at one or zero percent uh, stamina, which is mind boggling after seven hours to be exact at that point. Now, could I have gone further? maybe a little bit further. I mean, I ended at the top of a hill, so that probably impacted things slightly. Uh, and I was definitely shocked. But with the right motivation, I probably could have gone another five or 10K as I'd gone 118K or something like that. So, uh, you know, not like a ton longer, but I could have gone a little bit longer if I had to. Uh, and of course, it's all relative. Like, could I have done that at that intensity or could I just have like plodded along to get to the finish there? Uh, and so I think that's in general gets you in the ballpark what you're looking for and certainly helpful for endurance athletes to look at that and go, no, this pace is 100% not sustainable or yeah, this gets me about where I need to from a pacing or distance standpoint. Okay, so let's go back into a hike. Actually, I'm gonna close off these real quick. And I'm just going to use a different watch now because I've got the hikes already on this watch. This is the 7 uh, as opposed to 7X. And you can see hike. I'm going to go into that. And I'm going to go up here at the top. So pressing this upper button and go to courses. And I'm going to load up the course that I had. Uh, one, one's one of the ones I hiked from last week. So this one right here, Tenerife Coastline and Jungle. Uh, and I can look at the map. So I can see that right there. Uh, so map. I just find using the buttons a lot easier to zoom than trying to tap that little dot right there on the side there. But you can do that. And you can see it's relatively responsive to move around. Uh, you know, I would say it's in the same ballpark as most phones, unless you pre-cached all those tiles. But um, most of the time you're pulling them off the internet versus this is just pulling them off the device. Uh, and then go back out here. You can see, there we go. And that's my actual route there. I'm going to click on back though. And I'm going to show you there's the elevation plot that will pull this up of this particular hike. These are all in meters uh, for what it's worth. And then here's my view climbs. So this is Climb Pro. I love Climb Pro, one of my favorite features. And as I'm climbing, it shows me where I am on that particular climb. And you can see uh, these are all my climbs up ahead. Climb one, descent one. You can turn on descents, by the way, in the Climb Pro settings, something to consider doing. I love that for hiking primarily. Uh, you can't turn it on for cycling though. So just for uh, like the pedestrian activities. Uh, and then if you go down, you can see all the different uh, total descents and climbs. And you'll see these in real time as you're going uh, during the climb itself. And here's a quick photo of that on the screen. But we'll go ahead and go on back. Uh, and then we can go to do course. Uh, and this will go ahead and load up that course. I'm going to go scroll down through some of the different data pages that I've set up right here. Uh, now, this is the up ahead feature. Now, right now, sitting here, you know, a thousand miles away from Tenerife, uh, you won't see these. But instead, here's a photo of what it actually looks like on the course. And this will now show you the up ahead uh, distances to your next waypoints. Uh, now, waypoints are hardly new in uh, sport watches that have been around for years. But this is a single glanceful page uh, with standardized icons. And you can customize the names that are listed next to them however you want using Garmin Connect or Garmin Connect Mobile. So you can import any course into this from any platform. I created this course actually in Commute. It synced to Garmin Connect. And then I went ahead and I assigned uh, those particular names for them. Uh, so I basically said, hey, create this for the Forest Valley, this for the Summit, the Coastal Overlook, etc. 
Garmin says that coming up shortly, they'll be able to pull those from third-party files directly, so you can be able to create them directly in third-party uh, you know, platforms and have those same standardized icons show up there. But right now, you have to at least tag those icons in Garmin Connect, but it's not too big of a deal in most cases. Uh, and I just found this super easy to glance at and say, okay, this is how far to all these quick things allowed me to plan my day a little bit better. Next, there's also a slew of new graphical data pages on the Phoenix 7 series. Uh, so let me just see if I got any of them right here that are easy to show you. Uh, it's a bit hard to show them while I'm sitting here. So instead, here is a picture of those graphical data pages. Uh, I believe this first one right now will show me uh, my elevation and my heart rate on the same page. Uh, and then you can customize these however you want. Uh, and you can see also the difference between the Epic series and the Phoenix 7 from a brightness, a clarity, color standpoint. I mean, it's just world's difference between those two watches uh, in all conditions, by the way. So uh, whether I was the top of volcano in super sunny conditions or in the forest in dark conditions or at night, hands down, without question, the Epix is a better screen uh, to use. And that's partly because the sapphire glass in this case, uh, but just also the AMOLED display is stunning. And this is not like AMOLED displays of the past or LCD displays of the past that are hard to see outdoors. This is brilliantly easy to see outdoors in every single sunny or non-sunny condition. Uh, and this, the Phoenix 7 is too, but that's like a whole different level of easy to see and display clarity. Okay, a couple, couple more things on the sensors just to back out of this real quick. Uh, so I'm gonna go down to bike here and show you where to set up sensors. Uh, so you hold this up down button, again, note, touch disabled for this particular profile, uh, and go down even further, and you'll see sensors and accessories. And this is where I can add new sensors. So you can see I can add, uh, search all types, or search certain types of sensors, AMP Plus and Bluetooth Smart for all these, or most of these anyways, depending on the particular type of sensor. Uh, there's lots of options here. And you can go back and I can see which ones I've already paired. So my heart rate sensors, some extra straps there, foot pods, power meters, uh, trainers, uh, those are all in there. Uh, in addition though, I can go, oops, sorry, sensor back there, into wrist heart rate, and I can turn on broadcasting in here if I want to. So I can say uh, broadcast heart rate, and this will broadcast on both AMP Plus as well as Bluetooth Smart. Once I hit this button there, and of course, once I wear it on there, on my wrist. Uh, and this is a quick and easy way if you want to broadcast an app like Zwift or Peloton, or Trainer Road, whatever the case may be. Now, next, one of the new features on the Phoenix 7 series is the ability to go ahead and change the data fields from your phone. So I'm going to do that right now and show you this in real time here. Uh, so pull my phone up real quick and open up the Garmin Connect app. And now I'm connected right here. Uh, and what you do is you see under activities and apps, uh, it's right there. And now I can manage all the settings from my phone. So if I go to manage, uh, I can go ahead and do this. And there, it's a bit of like a pile of settings and options. Like it's all just sort of dumped in here in one spot. My phone's also struggling a little bit because I've got so many devices it's all connecting to. Uh, so here are all the different uh, apps and sport profiles. I can add them if I want to. If I go back here now, I can go edit settings and I can choose what I want to edit. Um, so that first one is to go ahead and choose which sport profiles to add. But I can say, hey, I want to edit my run settings uh, and then go into this. And it can be a little bit slow at times. Again, it's connecting to four different watches at once, so it's also slowing things down a fair bit. My data screens, and then go and create all my data screens here. Now, it's not like complete in a sense that I can't transfer stuff from my older watches. I have to recreate it here, but it's a starting point anyways. So you can see these are my different pages I've set up on this particular watch. I can choose to add a new data screen. I can say custom data, for example. I can choose what particular layout I want. Uh, so you can see all the layouts right there. Uh, and then I can go and say, I want uh, six fields. And there we go. Uh, and this, I'm just gonna change these particular fields right now. So just kind of do a couple more quick ones here. Let's just call this heart rate. And then you can see uh, it'll go through and do this entire entire process. I won't like bore you with going through and, and setting a bunch of data fields over and over and over again. Uh, but you can see all the other options are here as well. So for example, uh, my routing options, my auto opt options, my speed, uh, pretty much everything, even my satellite options are shown right there uh, as to what I want to use, the system defaults. Uh, and so as I noted, like this is just a giant dump of settings for the most part. They're all in here. There are some things that are not in here. For example, map manager isn't shown in here. If you want to do map management, you got to do it from the watch itself. Uh, but I think this is a good first step. I've long said to Garmin that like, don't try to boil the ocean on this, just start somewhere. And to be fair, they started somewhere. It's not perfect, uh, but you can at least start and do some of the settings or most of the settings, uh, almost all the settings, in fact, on the phone itself. And then down the road, hopefully they'll improve that, allow you to transfer between devices, for example, like they do on the Edge Series devices. Uh, that would be a good start. 
So with that, let's talk about the map manager. Uh, so I'm gonna go and tap this option right here, uh, and this will get me the sport modes, and we'll go down into map manager. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, with the Sapphire editions, your maps are largely preloaded uh, based on your region. So they're all set there already, and you've got 32 gigs of storage, and that's why they can do that. But in the non-Sapphire editions, you have 16 gigs of storage. And for Garmin to preload those maps across all those regions and the 22 different Phoenix 7 options that there are, that would balloon the number of SKUs for all those regions by like 100. It's kind of insane. So they don't do that. Instead, you got to download them yourself. Uh, but there are some maps that are always pre-downloaded, which are the ski view maps, uh, and the course view, which are your golf course maps, and then this world-wide uh, kind of base map, which is totally useless. So just ignore that. Uh, what you really want are these topo active maps up here at the top. I'm going to select that. And then I can choose what other countries I want to update. So in this case, I already have North America on there. I already have Europe on there, but there are updates available. Uh, and these updates, unfortunately, are just re-downloading the whole darn thing again. Uh, and they're huge. If I click on this right now for this, it's going to download 10.8 gigs. It's going to take a while. Uh, so I won't do that. Instead, I'll go down to Add Map. And you can scroll down. You can see it's got Find Wi-Fi. This requires Wi-Fi. requires open Wi-Fi. So I'm probably not going to work at like a hotel room, for example, uh, where they've got you know some sort of authentication prompt. So just keep this in mind. you got to do this before you get where you're going. Uh, but if you are in a hotel room and you need to download maps, you can use Garmin Express on your computer if you have a computer with you. Let me just cancel this out so it didn't get so excited over there. Okay, so switching to a watch that I've actually got the Wi-Fi set up right now for here. I uh, keep on resetting these units. So in this case, if I look at the options, I can download South America at 6 gigs, uh, Taiwan, China, Hong Kong, uh, MENA, Japan, uh, etc. I believe this is Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, uh, in the Philippines. I've asked the government for some clarification on some of these. Like some of these aren't super awesome, obvious. Uh, and some of them will even show me uh, a little outline of the country. It's funny like which ones do and don't. So I think this one does, uh, but they don't in the update page before. Uh, but nonetheless, you can see it's there. I then click on download. Uh, and then this will queue it for the next time that I plug it in. Uh, now in this case it won't because there's not enough space for it. So I have to delete something else. So I'll choose something smaller just to show you this. There we go, Taiwan's only 100 megs. And you can see that little map of that. Uh, and I'll click download. There we go. And then it'll only download when it's plugged onto a charging device. So make sure you plug it into a wall or something, or like a battery pack, not into a computer, uh, because then it won't actually trigger this. Uh, and it'll be in a queue. So you can see I've also got Australia already in the queue and this in the queue. Uh, now, in general, this is really, really slow. So uh, I updated, I think it was North America, Europe of the night, which are both like roughly 10, eight to 10 gigs. Uh, and that took about four and a half hours. So you're looking at roughly an hour per two, two and a half gigs, give or take. Uh, it's not fast. It's fine like if you're just going to plug it in overnight or something like that. Uh, but definitely do this before you get to where you're going. This is an area I'd love to see Garmin do a little more like definition of this. Like countries, for example, if I look at Wahoo, at Crew, or Hammerhead, sorry, or other companies that have this on their cycling computers, you don't have to download the entire continent, which is huge. Uh, you can download just the country you want, which is great, you know, for last minute additions. Uh, but still, it's awesome that it's here. It's free. Uh, and again, these these maps, Topo Active, mean they include all the popularity routing, all the trails, all the point of interest, all that stuff is on here uh, in these maps, and you don't have to do anything else other than just simply download them. So last but not least, we will talk about music and uh, the Garmin Pay. So if I go back here, also the Garmin Connect IQ App Store. Uh, so let's do that first. I'm going to tap this upper right hand button. Again, right next to Map Manager, you probably noticed uh, the Garmin Connect IQ Store. I can tap that right there, and it's going to load up some recommended apps. Now, Garmin talked about this last fall, uh, introducing this. Uh, and it is super, super duper basic, like as basic as you can possibly get. It's going to show me a handful, about half a dozen recommended apps uh, that I want to download, and also show me the apps I've already downloaded. So I can tap on this right here, and I can see AccuWeather, Surfline, Strava, and Deezer. And undoubtedly, this will change over time. Uh, I can then tap on one of these. So I can say AccuWeather, sure, install it, and it's going to say preparing. And now it's going to take a long time. Uh, and it's not like forever. It's going to take like a minute all in to do this. It's going to search for Wi-Fi. And then from there, it'll download that app. And you can see it's, it's not like super complicated. It's a little bit cumbersome uh, and very, very basic. And now in theory, it's done. Uh, let's see if it goes down there. There we go. Uh, and now you think you better just tap this to open it up, but you can't. You have to go back here and then up here and then down uh, to find it. There we go, Minicast, and now it can open it up. Uh, and of course, at this point, it needs to usually talk to my phone and so on. But the point is, you can at least do this from your watch for some basic apps, but you can't search for other apps or anything like that. Uh, so anyways, going on back into music. So I'm gonna go scroll down here, and I've already installed the Spotify app on this particular watch. 
Uh, so apparently Spice Girls is part of this particular playlist. Uh, I downloaded the top 50 countdown from Peloton, uh, so that's why it's that particular thing. I'm not normally a Spice Girls person, but you know, hey, if it's there, it's there. So uh, in this case, I could do add music, uh, and this is pulling from my Spotify account, uh, and then playlist, and then I can cast those playlists on the device itself. At that point, you need some sort of headphones to be able to play that music. Uh, so as long as those headphones are paired to this, there's no speaker in this watch. You can see this uh, playlist is already on there. I can see additional playlists. These will populate through. There we go. Uh, just like that, showing the icon. It's not super fast, but once you have the playlist on your watch, you don't need your phone at all. You can go off and you know, go for a run with just the watch and headphones uh, and listen to music, no problems at all. Uh, so this is also Amazon Music and Deezer, uh, other service I think as well all part of this, the same experience so that you've had on all the Garmin watches that have music over the last couple of years. Last but not least, we've got the ability to do uh, the contactless payments. So up left hand corner here, hold this down for a second, into the controls menu, swirl around so you find your wallet, uh, and then you will go ahead and set this up on your watch ahead of time, sorry, on your phone ahead of time. Uh, so I'm gonna add my passcode in real quick. You can either do this via tap or via buttons. I find the um, buttons actually probably the quickest. And now it's going to have my uh, Visa card preloaded, assuming it's supported in your country. It's not just Visa, it's your bank, your actual exact bank has to be supported. So in the US, it's generally no problems. Here in the Netherlands, uh, my bank ING is not supported, but other banks are. Again, it really varies on your country. Uh, and it is a bank to bank thing. Garmin has to go to these exact banks behind the scenes, Chase in this case, even though it's a Visa card, negotiate that, uh, figure that out, implement that, uh, and it just takes forever. Uh, so. If you've got a bank that supported, great. If not, you'll probably never ever use a feature. But at this point, you go and just tap it on the reader, just like you would with your phone or anything like that, and it'll pay for that purchase, and you're good to go. So at this point, I've covered everything except for two little things I forgot earlier on, some physical things. Uh, number one is that there is now button guards on the upper start stop button. So you kind of barely see it there. See how there's like this little cage that goes around this uh, versus compared to the Phoenix 6 in the past, the button just sticks out. Uh, Garmin thinking was that you could uh, hit this with your jacket, not thinking. It's certainly, you can hit this with your jacket and stop and start activities, which you wouldn't want. So the button guard prevents that from happening. I'll say it takes like a day or two to get used to the button guards uh, because sometimes they're used to just pressing this way and then hitting the button. But once I've gotten used to it, it's totally cool. I'm all good with that. The other thing you'll notice on the top is that uh, there is now a extra screw covering the lugs up here, uh, as well as an extra piece of you know metal there, uh, titanium, I think exactly. Uh, so you can see in the Phoenix 6 that doesn't exist versus over here, that is there. Uh, so that is your entire like tutorial of sorts on uh, the Phoenix 7 series. I've also got one of these on the Epic series up in the corner there, and I've got a complete comparison video between the Phoenix 7 series and the Epics uh, that you can dive in to kind of see some of the more nuanced features between those. Uh, but hopefully you found this interesting or useful. If so, again, you got this far in the video, definitely please give a like at the bottom there uh, or hit subscribe because I've got plenty more videos on these watches. I've got a bunch of cool like videos coming up on uh, this and using it for the last six or seven weeks across a wide variety of things, wide variety of sports and scenarios and areas uh, that I want to dive into a little bit more. With that, thanks for watching and have a good one.